I want to talk to you today about the impact of architecture on our lives, on our behavior, and our social interaction as social animals. How are, how are we affected by the shape of spaces within buildings, the spaces between buildings? How do they shape our ability to learn, to work, to live, and to create community? We don't live in a natural environment. We live in a constructed environment. When you think about it, 80% of Canadians live in an urban place. 50% of the entire world's population lives in an urban context. And in, by 2050, it'll be almost two-thirds of the world's population will live in constructed environments. So how we think about space and shape and place, is that not very fundamental to how we see ourselves and how our lives in, with their many facets are supported? It was Fascinating in this morning, some of this morning's talk, Mandek talked about the constraints of society and the constraints of space. Jessica talked about cultural matters, the importance of culture. And Professor Goff spoke about climate change. How does architecture impact each of these areas? Are we happy with the environments within, we live, within which we live? Or are we simply working around the limitations of the spaces that we occupy? When you think about it, I believe we should demand of our architects, we should demand the kind of space and characteristics of space that allow us to create, to innovate, to play, and to connect with great success. We need to demand of our architects the spaces that really support community, connection, collaboration. It's been a theme that's talked about so much today. How do we have the spaces that facilitate that? Because space does make that difference. How do we make the spaces that connect us to our culture, the places that, and our stories, the places that mean things to us, the people and the rituals that are meaningful in our lives? How do we honor history, where we've come from and where we're going? How does architecture incorporate those aspects in the, in the world? And most, perhaps, significantly at this point in our history, how do we shape, and we need to demand that the shape of our built environment solves the problem of energy use, climate change, carbon emissions. It's fundamentally important, as we heard uh, earlier. 50% of all energy use in North America is the operation and functions of buildings. We think plane, trains, and automobiles um, are a significant impact, which they are, but they are half the impact of the built environment. So that energy use translates into carbon emissions, which affects climate change, and we as architects have an ability to shape and change because the technologies are available and the understanding of how to change the function of building is available to us. And you, as the community, need to demand these characteristics of us. But let's return for a moment to the first issue, the shape of space and how it impacts us. Dr. Jonas Salk, who, as you know, invented the polio vaccine, was working for many years in a, in a laboratory in Pittsburgh, below grade, not natural lit, naturally lit, constrained, but nevertheless with all the instruments and equipped he needed, equipment he needed to do his research. But over several years of research, there was a level of frustration that he wasn't making the progress he had imagined. And he took a break and he traveled to Italy. And in that, uh, trip to Italy, he stayed in a monastery, not because of its monastic characteristics, but because it was an extraordinary building from the medieval era. It had scale and quality, natural light, gardens, uh, the views and position of the building and the, and the drama of the architecture created a great environment. And suddenly for him, it unleashed the creativity, it unleashed the 
innovation that he'd been seeking in his research. And he became profoundly convinced that that innovation and that unleashed creativity that he had discovered after the frustrations of the working in the environment in Pittsburgh was in no small way due to the quality of the space and the architectural environment where he was working. And that led him to become a champion of great architecture and to build an extraordinary complex in California called the Salk Institute. But I think that, that when you look at that understanding, can we be more scientific and precise about understanding what he discovered in that sojourn in, in great architecture? We know that the dimensions of space, the scale of ceilings, we can measure that the, the, the quantity and characteristics and configuration of space has a positive impact on our creative thought process, on our understanding, on our ability to learn. We also understand that natural light, for example, good south light and views will cause patients to heal in a hospital setting as much as 20% faster than an environment which, without those characteristics. We know that good light and view and good, good environment has a measurable impact on student outcomes. And we know that we can, with a magnetic resonance brain scans, track our human responses to different kinds of space, curvilinear space, and different kinds of space that make us aware and motivated or make us anxious and fearful. So when we think about space, how do we incorporate those elements, and how do we translate our need for those, those qualities into space which has many other characteristics like connection and human interaction. The room that we're in this morning is a single relationship between my standing at the front of the room and looking across 25 rows or more to the back of the room. My connection might be good with the, those few in the few, first few rows, but as, as the dimension gets farther, that connection and conversation and learning gets more disconnected. In this room that you see in a, in a university in Kamloops in British Columbia, it's a room for 300 um, people, slightly larger than this room, but it's configured very differently. It's configured in the round. It's a lecture theater. It performs the same role in that university that this room does in this university. But that community has a significant percentage of the students are First Nations students. And in conversations with those uh, users, if you will, of the university, we talked about the value of a circular conversation. A room which not only can have projection and, and a speaker who can talk um, as a single person, but also a room that can facilitate connection across the spaces. That you're not looking at the backs of people's heads, but you're facing people. And there can be a conversation which happens in the round. We dimension the center of that circle as a place for music, for dancing, for lecturing, for performance. And it really becomes inclusive and drawing on some of the, the First Nations traditions um, in that community. It's also made, as you can see in the ceiling, with timber that was killed by climate change. Pine beetle killed wood in northern British Columbia, which is harvested off the forest floor. And we can, it's, it's a waste material, but we can use that material to create, from a sustainable point of view, a room that not only creates community and facilitates conversation, but is done so, has done so in a kind of very uh, environmentally appropriate way. In another space, also in British Columbia, but in Vancouver, at the University of British Columbia, in a law school, the thought we, we imagined, could we make a lecture space and a meeting space that was not a closed room like this is, but was an open room, where lectures, scheduled lectures, could take place, but passerby moving through that community could overlook through the balconies and the openings that you see around the space, could engage, whether it was a, a, a lecture of interest 
or they were looking for friends, or simply being aware of the activity going on in the space. But we invested that space, we imagined, with other characteristics. Could we make a whole window, one whole side of the, of the building, uh, of the room, I should say, open to, the, open to natural light and view, so that we have projection, we have space for teaching, but we have views to the landscape, to the ocean and the mountains beyond. And does that create a better learning environment? And can we connect that space on the other side of the glass to landscape, to a water court, to First Nations, to the landscape in a way that enhances that teaching capability? In another kind of science building in Philadelphia, a space, a courtyard, enclosed at the center of the, of the building, which is open to natural light, circled by the connections and, and communications so that all the passerby in the building see each other, uh, connected by a vertical helical stair, really based on the kind of diagram of, uh, of DNA, and and conditioned by a living biofilter. Could we use living technology um, where the air in the building circulates through that wall five stories high, 80% of the contaminants are cleaned in that space, energy efficient um, and is, is improved and humidification occurs naturally. In a high-rise research facility where there's 22 floors of research labs, what was the most important thing to do? Of course, to make great flexible laboratories properly equipped and full of daylight. But most important was to create the interconnections, the neighborhoods, floor by floor, three floors interconnected with stairs, natural light view, and informal seating with a kind of geometry that causes people to relax and connect and dis discuss and think about the research happening in the lab. And can that space also connect to the exterior so the work of research is not mysterious, but it's revealed to the community, it's revealed to the city, and that sense of breaking down the barriers between research and the community can be established. Can buildings be shaped in response to topography and cultural impact? This is a painting by A.Y. Jackson of Mount Peter and Mount Paul in the Okanagan. That sacred space for First Nations, and you see it here in this photograph, seen from the site of another academic building. What we did was shape that academic building in direct response to the landscape, in direct response to the topography, and created a sense of cultural meaning related to the First Nations in the community, um, a law school where the majority, or not the majority, but many of the students are from First Nations, and that sense of meaning and relevance that makes that connection. In Regent Park, 50 to 60 different languages spoken, a, an enormously rich and diverse cultural uh, components of that, uh, and communities in that, that neighborhood. Looking at all the national flags from those 50 different nations, could we make a frieze around the building which, which is not specific to a particular nation, but creates an iconography and a meaning which is recognizable in this arts and cultural center? So that sense of belonging, of connection, recognition of the traditions where all of these communities come together and all the artistic traditions um, arise. In Evergreen at the Brickworks in the Don Valley, the sense of art, artists and the community making the elements that make this facade. The facade can literally be changed on, an, on a seasonal basis. So that ability to make panels on the ground, hang them and open them to admit winter sun in the cold weather or close them to shade against summer sun in good weather. The building is now built and the screens will be going on soon. One of the things I discovered in my studies as an architect in a tour through the Eaton Center with the architect who designed it was that that building, even in the dead of winter, in cold weather like today, is air conditioned all year long. So it's not heated in the winter, it's air conditioned. The impact of understanding the amount of heat that buildings produce, lighting, people, computers, machinery, can we recover all that heat and can we re 
we retain that heat rather than air condition and throw it into the atmosphere. Um, and so we did so at the University of Ontario in Oshawa, where those 400 wells, 600 feet into the earth, recover the heat, uh, really the heat pulled together from all the, the activities in the building and the heat through the summer and stores that heat deep in the stable temperature of the ground. And in cold weather like this, that heat is pulled back into the environment to kind of keep those buildings warm. So an enormous six years was all it took to pay back that premium cost. And that, and for all the kind of future years of that university, the savings are enormous in terms of that energy consumption, reduced carbon footprint, highly sustainable. And in fact, now it's possible to not have buildings as net users of energy, but net producers of energy. And we're working on a couple of buildings now that will actually be able to be zero carbon footprint and zero energy use in terms of um, producing the net. The sense of color that we can use in a building for photography at Ryerson University, photography being made with light, can we make a facade with light? highly energy efficient LED lighting, changeable, and with my iPhone, I can change as a passerby, and you can get the, the app, change the color of that building. It's a way to connect that building to the community, to make it relevant in the downtown Toronto. And kind of finally, the issue of heritage that we are so busy innovating, creating, and changing. It's isn't it very important for us not only to create the touchstones with our culture, but the touchstones with our history. This is a church in Toronto. So many of these churches where the congregations and the life of the church has changed, they're no longer used as churches and they're chopped up as uh, condominiums. In this case, with what had always been a congregation of gathering for this local community, rather than convert it into a condominium and privatize that space, we developed, and it will be soon under construction, that sense of making a stone courtyard walled with the walls restored of the heritage, so retaining and respecting the heritage and making a place of quiet and contemplation that is a green crossroads for that community. That sense of Rec respecting history, culture, space, recognizing the importance of architecture um, in improving the conditions where we can create and innovate, and that sense of being effective about the climate change and reducing that 50% uh, energy commitment to the built world down much closer to zero. Those are the things that I really challenge you to kind of take away from today, to think about and think about how we can together as architects, designers, and the community most importantly, to make that change happen. Thank you very much.